This morning, Beto O'Rourke supporters fighting back, airing negative ads against Ted Cruz. Will they help or hurt? Also, what's the likelihood of a moderate Democrat flipping a Republican state house district Hillary Clinton won in 2016? We'll talk with the Democrat. Plus, Texas Catholic Diocese announced renewed transparency with allegations of abuse. Governor Greg Abbott, a Catholic, is noticeably silent. And will Dallas ISD close dozens of neighborhood schools? Superintendent Michael Hinojosa is in studio to explain. Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley starts now. Good morning and welcome to Inside Texas Politics. I'm Marie Saavedra in for Jason Whiteley this week. We want to start this Sunday with Dallas ISD Superintendent Michael Hinojosa. He is in studio to talk about the district's long range facilities plan and joining in our questioning this morning, Bud Kennedy with the Star-Telegram. Good morning to you Good morning, both. Marie, Dr. Good morning, thank you for having me. Thank you for being with us. I, I want to start with this week you released a video mm -hmm. and it was in response to the long range plan. A lot of people just heard that headline uh, that many people grabbed their attention, 47 bills buildings possibly being taken down in this plan. I understand you released this video sort of answering the questions and the fears of parents. Why was it important for you all to do that? Well, it's important because uh, there was some miscommunication, maybe some missteps along the way. But like you said, this is a long range master plan. This is a 10 year plan. And unfortunately, urban districts don't have the luxury of doing long term plans. Many uh, suburban communities do. But what we've decided to do for the last 15 months is to study how efficient, how how good our facilities are. We know we have to compete with suburbs and charter schools and private schools. And quite honestly, our facilities have been very inadequate in the past. So we presented this information. We laid it out to the board. And one of the things that we've learned is you need to lay the information out to your elected trustees before you take any action and let, get feedback from them. So we laid it out and then some information got out and uh, certainly we needed, we needed to co correct the record and um, answer some questions for the community. Okay. So what's your correction then if people... Well, the correction is, is a lot of people thought that this was going to happen immediately. And in fact, we've just laid it out. If you're in a football game, we just hit the kickoff. I and mean, this could be a four quarter game with an overtime because eventually the board has to adopt this or not. We just laid it out and said, this is what we need to consider. This is how old our buildings are. We had gave them all kinds of data on the buildings. If we Here's, let's take one example because there's been a lot of uh, uh, angst in one of our in North Oak Cliff right now mm -hmm. because they have three schools that we were proposing building a brand new school to replace some of these three older schools, one of which I went to school in. But the thing is, if that were to happen, that school would not open until 2024, 2025. Nothing is imminent, so those other schools wouldn't close till 2022 or 23 if the board approved everything that we presented. And knowing this board, we have to take several iterations to the board. So we just started the conversation. People jumped to the fourth quarter immediately when we haven't even finished the first quarter of laying all this information out. How soon could these initial conversations and proposals to the board start? Well, we're going to, we started once, we're going to have another meeting with the board coming up soon. But in the meantime, in November, December, January, and February, we're going to go to the community and hear from all of them. We're going to have meetings in all quadrants of the community to get feedback from them. And we'll bring that back to the board. The board members are going to have their own meetings and no action has to take place for a while. Uh, and in fact, the one thing that will require some action is uh, we're under a current bond program and we decide to pivot under the current program, then at some point the board needs to decide how we're going to phase out the current bond program. But nothing is imminent, nothing would happen in any for the next several uh, months. Well, if, you, if you're if you making this a five-year, ten-year plan, you base some of these decisions on current enrollments, though, and then the projections call for elementary schools about 850 kids. Isn't that big for an elementary school? The further away you take elementary schools, the more you combine, then you lose more kids, and most of all, you lose more parent involvement. Well, actually, we have um, Anne Frank Elementary School in North, Oak in North Dallas has a, over 1,200 students, and they all come from the neighborhood, and, and it's a very successful school. It's been very successful. Uh, it, a, lot, a lot of it depends. One thing we have learned, if you're from Dallas, you've seen what happened in Ross Avenue, you've seen what's happened down Singleton, and you've seen what happened in Davis, where 
rental homes and rental apartments have all been taken down and they've been replaced with very expensive apartments where our families can't live. We've just lived that on Ross Avenue, so we've turned those schools into transformation and innovation schools. A similar thing could happen in those other communities, but we needed to lay out, this, this is the condition of the building, this is how many students this hold, and, and this is you know what needs to be repaired. So all of that could change, and we are doing enrollment projections, but we had to, we've never had the opportunity or the luxury to lay out a master plan over multiple years. Superintendent, this plan, even though it is early, uh, would cost millions. A lot of people who are asking for help in their own schools that may be in really poor shape are struggling hearing about millions of dollars being spent, but not seeing that even in the short term for improvements in their own schools. And that's why they are critical of this plan. What do you say to them? Well, what we say to that is we're going to take some individual schools and we're going to modernize them completely, just like the suburban schools have, like irrigation, like marquees, like all the aesthetics. And we're going to start slow with the schools that need it the most. And as we've identified this in the master plan, it's called a, a facility condition index so we're starting with the ones in most need this if it costs more money the voters would have to decide that in 2021 if we get support so this is a long way out and we feel that the only way that property value increase has helped us is on the debt side we need fewer pennies to pay back for these bond programs we don't anticipate this would be a tax increase in 2021 does, are there going to be any improvements in the short term, though? That doesn't take any of those off the table? With this no, we, there are going to be some improvements in the short term. And we, we're actually finishing modernizing most of the high schools. We'll be down to, f if, if we pivot a little bit, we can modernize every high school under the current plan. And then we'll go back and do the middle school and elementary schools. If some of these properties went up for lease, uh, you, you're not the only school system in town. Say a charter school system wanted to lease one up right in that neighborhood. Would you lease to a charter school? Well, the law requires it to, for us to offer it up. Uh, for since we can't um, just arbitrarily sell our properties to anybody or lease them to anybody. We have to make it an offer, and if a charter school wants to submit a request, we can approve or reject that request. So it's an opportunity that we would have. Some of those buildings, I think, though, we, we will repurpose, uh, just like we've done on Ross Avenue. We turned JFK into an all-boys solar prep. We turned JW Ray into Ignite Middle School. These are specialty schools, and some of that could happen in some of these communities. S some people went exactly to tearing down a building. Well, that may or may not happen. We're just very early in the process. Lastly, Superintendent, about 30 seconds left. I wanted to ask what people can do to voice their thoughts on this plan in the short term. Well, people have been very vocal, and we thank them. Uh, and please continue to communicate. But in the meantime, we're going to have meetings in the next four months in all four quadrants of town, and we'll be announcing those with plenty of lead time okay. so people can come out and, and give us their opinion. All right, Superintendent Hinojosa, thank you so much. Thank Bud, you so we'll much. be back with you a thank little you. bit later in the show. Texas Catholic officials announced this week that all dioceses will release the names of clergy who have been credibly accused of sexual abuse. That list will come out early next year. Governor Greg Abbott, a Catholic, has been noticeably silent after the Conference of Bishops went public with this news. Alana Rocha is in for Ross Ramsey this week. She's one of the reporters at the Texas Tribune. Glad to have you, Alana. I want to get straight to the governor uh, not making a public statement about this announcement. Is that surprising? You know, not necessarily. I mean, he, uh, as a bishop who is a good friend of his, spoke at his inauguration some years ago, said uh, at the time that he's not the Catholic governor of Texas or the governor of Catholic Texas. Still, there are eight and a half million Catholics here, himself at the helm. Uh, you know, might be a little surprising to some that he didn't uh, make a comment. He likely would, you would expect, when that list comes out on January 31st or so of next year. But uh, yeah, no comment so far. All right, let's talk polls now. A new Quinnipiac poll shows Senator Ted Cruz up nine percentage points over Beto O'Rourke. Upshot, their poll also has Cruz ahead. How does this play with just a little less than four weeks out from the election? You know, it could it could uh, energize uh, Beto's base saying, hey, he was ahead at least in one poll by two points, still within the margin of error. Uh, but yeah, the fact that both of these polls show Cruz ahead, uh, some are saying it stabilizes the Republican incumbent's lead. Others say, uh, you know, it was a, a live poll of mix of cell phones and landlines, who's answering the phone of a number they don't recognize. Um, so how accurate is it actually to paint the picture of who turns out? And that'll be the key. You know, no matter how many people register, there's a big disparity there between registered voters and likely voters, at least in this state. So the only poll that matters is the one on Election Day. That's for sure. All right, Alana Rocha, thank you from the Texas Tribune. We'll check in with you a little bit later in the show.
Governor Greg Abbott and challenger Lupe Valdez met in their first and only debate two weeks ago. The two discussed their positions on Texas having a red flag law as a way to prevent school shootings. A judge could remove a gun from someone presenting a threat. Our next contributor says school safety is important, but safeguards are needed to prevent the system from being abused. Here's Sydney Walker from Coffee and Politics 101 with my voice, my opinion. During the gubernatorial debate, both Governor Abbott and challenger Lupe Valdez discussed their positions on red flag alerts to prevent more school shootings. No one would argue the safety of our children is important. People can report hearsay making claims your child having access to a gun, saying they will harm others, or claim your child has cut themselves intentionally. Now your child has been sent home, has to take a psych eval or face stronger consequences because of red alerts. If you're an involved parent, institutions will still treat you as if they have to raise your child. In a time when accusations can be life altering, it is of the utmost importance investigations are done on claims before turning them into facts. We want adults and students to feel safe reporting potential threats, but safeguards are needed to prevent false claims and abuse of the system. I am Sydney Walker, and this is my voice, my opinion. Coming up next, we'll talk with the moderate Democrat who hopes to win a Texas district seat held by Republicans for decades. Hillary Clinton won that district in 2016. And coming up next, the polls in the U.S. Senate race. One shows Ted Cruz up by nine percentage points. Another has Beto O'Rourke winning by two points. Mark and Rich debate what the polls really mean in Flashpoint. Stay with us. Another star team Trumper is on her way out of the White House. Nikki Haley, Trump's ambassador to the United Nations, she plans to leave the White House by the end of the year. She said she wants to spend more time away from Trump's family. And so she... <laughs> about Texas, DQ's Chicken Strip Country Basket. Crispy chicken strips, fries, Texas toast, and plenty of country gravy, just $4.99. DQ, that's what I like about Texas. Brianna was diagnosed with visual and auditory processing disorder, and when she wouldn't have the success she was looking for, you could just see her kind of going into her shell. The assessment showed me that there was actually more of a struggle there than even we were aware of. Brain Balance gave Brianna the tools to succeed. She's in class, she's actually raising her hand and she's interacting. Her teachers are amazed. They're just amazed. Give your child the foundation they need to succeed in school. Call Brain Balance today. We are the lovers and fighters and up all nighters. We dominate, generate, Appreciate, motivate, celebrate, and above all, we are the women who create. Come one, come all for bargains galore under the big top and inside both stores. It's the gigantic fall tent sale at Freed's Furniture. Every item is on sale. There's so much great furniture, we needed the tent to display it all. Big savings on living rooms, dining rooms, bedrooms, mattress sets, and fine oriental and area rugs from famous brands like Bernhardt, Magnuson, Pulaski, Sealy, Serta, Tempur-Pedic, Universal, and many others. Astounding savings plus everything is available for immediate pickup or delivery during the gigantic fall tent sale at Freed's Furniture. Get ready to make a fitness connection. It's our biggest event of the year. Join for just $10 down and $10 a month. We know that the best workout is the one that works for you. Fitness Connection has a huge variety of amenities to keep your workout fresh and fun. And for a limited time, it's all just $10 down and $10 a month. Truth is, no other health club is as passionate about helping you reach your fitness goals. So don't just join a gym, make a fitness connection. Every rider has a story. For some, it takes an unexpected turn, but you don't have to face it alone. We're the first call riders make when they're injured. If you're injured in a motorcycle accident, call 1-800-LAW-TIGERS, Texas Motorcycle Lawyers.
Texas House District 114 has been held by Republicans for decades. It includes North Dallas and Lake Highlands. Hillary Clinton won there in 2016, and it is now considered a battleground district. We invited Republican candidate Lisa Luby Ryan to come on the show. She declined due to some prior commitments. John Turner, a moderate Democrat, hopes to win that seat in November. He is joining us this morning. John, thank you for being with us. Thank you very much for having me. I want to start with your moderate stance. Why do you think that is favorable for your campaign in this political climate? Are you seeing that part of it pay off? Well, yes, and this district I'm running in is a North Dallas district that I think has long been regarded as a center pragmatic kind of district. I think it's a pro public education district. It's a, a district that wants to support our first responders, uh, wants to be practical about solving problems. That's the kind of candidate I am, so I feel like I'm a good match for this district. Now, I understand that you, uh, you're an attorney. You represented right. school districts suing over school finance in 2012. I've read that that's part of not only why you decided to run your first time candidate, but also school financing and funding being one of your primary big issues. Speak to why that made such an impact on you in the, representing those school districts. Yes, well, as many of your viewers probably know, a majority of school districts in the state brought claims against the state of Texas beginning in 2012 related to the state's problems in the school funding system. And I had the opportunity to represent one coalition uh, that had about 88 school districts in it, including many in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, Richardson, ISD, Plano, Highland Park, and others. And fundamentally, even though in the end the school districts were not successful in the Supreme Court, right. the Supreme Court made clear that we had a lot of problems in our system and they needed to be addressed by the legislature. And so being involved in that case motivated me uh, to try to stay involved in the issue and to continue to contribute, if I could, to public schools. Is that an issue that you're seeing resonate with voters in your district? Absolutely. I, I think that is probably the top, uh, top issue, I should say, that's on the minds of voters that I talk to mm -hmm. uh, door to door is what can the legislature do to better support our public schools to take some of the burden off of local school districts and therefore local property taxpayers and help the state step up and do more uh, to help our schools. So a traditionally Republican district, now battleground, which is music to your ears, clearly, uh, running as a Democrat, is this truly flippable? And what, if anything, is happening right now that makes you feel more confident in that effort? I think there's no doubt uh, that we are in a good position in the race. And yes, we can certainly win this race. It, it, it's a combination of things. I think, first, there is a lot of energy and enthusiasm on the Democratic side right now uh, after the 2016 election and then after the legislative session in 2017. Uh, and then, at the same time, we're getting a lot of independent and moderate Republicans moving our direction. I think it's the combination of those two things that I'm seeing uh, that gives me confidence that we have a very good chance. In these last few weeks, what's your biggest hurdle, you think? Really, uh, we're down to the point where it's just about being on the ground and having a strong presence in this district. It's about knocking doors, which I'm doing as much as I can. It's about having small gatherings and meet and greets and encouraging our supporters to get out and make sure we turn out our voters uh, and, and work for every last vote. That's really the priority in this stretch run. Okay, John Turner running for District House District 114. Thank you for being with us. Now to the polls in the U.S. Senate race. They range from Ted Cruz holding a nine percentage point lead to Beto O'Rourke winning by two. What do they mean with less than four weeks until Election Day? That question sparked this morning's flashpoint. From the right, Mark Davis of 660 AM The Answer. And from the left, Rich Hancock from virtualnewscenter.com. Good morning, everyone. Well, polls in the U.S. Senate race in Texas range from a dead heat to Ted Cruz up by nine to Beto up by two. But I want to ask my friend Mark Davis, how much do these polls mean a month out? Uh, virtually nothing. And they may not mean a whole lot leading up to it. It's the oldest thing in the way. Every politician will tell you, if you only poll that counts, is the one on Election Day. And it's true, and especially when they are as widely divergent as now. I think the one that shows Beto up by two and the one that shows Cruz up by nine might be infused with each candidate's most passionate uh, voices. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of passion for Beto, a ton. Is there enough of it to beat a, a Republican rock star in a Republican state? Well, Republican rock star is a bit of a a bit of a stretch, I think. I the issue those is credentials. <laughs> I issue those credentials. I'll confirm it for you. The fact is, Ted Cruz is uh, an incumbent who should very well be reelected in a state like Texas. But as we've been talking about, and as the press has alluded to over and over again, as the Beto O'Rourke campaign has been harping on, it is going to be all about who shows up. Who shows up on November 6th, Who shows up for early voting could change this dynamic dramatically. 
dramatically. Is there a Kavanaugh bump? Well, let me confirm for you that there is, in view of the way that the smearing of a good man went. I don't know if Beto deserves to carry the, the damage for stuff that other Democrats did, but do you sense that? Is that does that make the Hill a little more uphill climb? The Kavanaugh bump, you mean, is it going to bump more women to get out and vote for no, Beto O'Rourke? Yes, I do. That's in not fact, the bump I was talking about. To, it is going to be a but bump. But you make an interesting Beto. point, because all the Republicans, we're ready to crawl on broken glass and, and, and vote Republican, but, but the, the folks that are not happy at how that went, there could, there could be some motivation there as well. There could be motivation, and in fact, this is what I love about politics and what I've always loved about politics. This should be about everybody showing up, because elections should be about who shows up. But, From the left, I'm Rich Hancock, virtualnewscenter.com. He always shows up. I'm Mark Davis from the right on 660 AM, The Answer. A record number of youth are registered to vote for the first time in Texas. I'll ask if they'll actually show up to vote in November. That's next on Reporters Roundtable. Is home improvement shopping cleaning you out? You won't feel that way at Seconds and Surplus. With discounts of up to 50 to 90% on the latest home improvements, you can hold on to more of your money. Here's your Buick, sir. Actually, that's my Buick. Your Buick doesn't have a roof rack. This is my Buick. How are we gonna fit in your mom's Buick? Easy. I like that new Buick. Me too. I was actually talking about that Buick. I knew that. Did you? Buick's fresh new lineup is full of surprises. Texas residents get this low mileage lease for around $199 per month. Or get nearly $4,200 below MSRP on this 2018 Encore Preferred. Time for a change. Bring in your gently used current fashions, shoes, handbags, and accessories to Clothes Mentor and receive cash on the spot. Clothes Mentor buys all major styles, brands, and looks for all your changing ways. So whether the season changes, your job changes, or you just change your mind, bring in your items to Clothes Mentor to put some cash in your pocket. Change is fun when you shop at Clothes Mentor. Clothes Mentor. Like the look, love the price. It looks as good as it sounds. The Bose Store Within a Store at Nebraska Furniture Mart. Explore the sound possibilities with interactive product displays and our on-site Bose factory reps. Discover wireless freedom, powerful sound. Try before you buy. Headphones to home theater systems. And with qualifying Bose purchases, use 48-month financing. To celebrate new Kansas City and Omaha Bose stores, enter to win awesome Bose speakers. Experience optimum sound from your electronics leaders, Bose and Nebraska Furniture Mart. Who knew? Yeah. So you're with the UPS store? Yes. In fact, we printed these right here. Oh, I thought you guys just did shipping. No, we do printing, packing, faxing, notarizing, shredding, mailboxing, copying, taping, binding, uh, <laughs> consulting, designing, returning, storing, printing. Oh, and of course, shipping. So you're in the shipping? We also do printing, packing, faxing. Come into the UPS store today for every aim your small business needs. And of course, shipping. Something's all wrong with Colin All Red. Maybe it's because he supports Bernie Sanders' government run health care scheme, which could take away your health care, costing us trillions. Or because All Red is all wrong about raising your taxes to pay for it. No wonder Pelosi's allies are all in for All Red, spending millions on his campaign. Because when it comes to liberal Colin All Red, he's all wrong for Texas. America First Action is responsible for the content of this advertising. Are home improvement stores picking your pocket? You won't feel that way at Seconds and Surplus. With discounts of up to 50 to 90% on the latest home improvements, you can hold on to more of your money. This is Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley on WFAA. It is time now for the Reporters Roundtable, putting the headlines into perspective this Sunday morning. We're joined still by Alana and Bud, joined now by Channel 8's political producer, Bernadine Steptoe. Thanks for joining us, Bernadine. Uh, we want to start with attack ads. The first from a pack uh, came this week. We saw a second one, all of them attacking Cruz, uh, one of them actually making fun of him for letting Trump talk about his wife in the 2016 Republican presidential campaign. I want to ask, Beto O'Rourke has said he wants to keep this campaign clean. Alana, I'll start with you. Do we think that these ads will help or hurt in that effort? 
I just wonder if they're coming too late. You know, we just saw polls come out last week and uh, looking at the, the numbers beyond the fact that, you know, both of them showed crews ahead by nine points. A lot of people have made up their minds already or say they have uh, as to who they're going to vote for in this race. So it might be too little too late. Uh, the first one that came out uh, from the Fire Ted Cruz pack was definitely entertaining, that being an actor, as you said, attacking uh, Cruz for butting up with uh, Trump despite what he said on the campaign trail in 2016. Second one now with uh, attacking his positions on pre-existing conditions. Uh, I just wonder, like I said, if it's too little too late. Bud, can this hurt him? Can this you know, hurt Cruz at this point? I like Sonny Carl Davis as an actor. I liked him <laughs> in Bernie. This is his character coming back. But this ad is more cute than effective. It's, it's fun to watch. But that kind of ad saying, well, now, you know, Ted, come on, Ted, that doesn't compare when Ted Cruz is running ads every day that say that Beto O'Rourke will impeach Trump, legalize drugs, and, and open the borders. I mean, at some point, Beto's got to punch back. I agree, and uh, I think th I don't think that it would have any kind of effect in the race at this point. And I think Alana is true is, is correct in saying that someone needed to do something to punch back at Cruz because he's been running so many negative ads against uh, Iraq. But we'll see. Okay, I want to move on now to something that perked a lot of ears this week. I'm calling it the Taylor Swift effect uh, for shorthand, but this is more people in younger generations registering to vote. Taylor Swift saying that she encouraged people to get out and register for the midterms. We've seen that in the numbers registered. Will this increase in young people paying attention to these midterm elections lead them to actually show up in November? Bud, what do you think? Well, they were the lowest voters, the worst voters of the 2016 election, so young people have a long way to go. I can only tell you we'll see when early voting starts, I tell people to go to the college campuses to vote. They put voting boxes at TCU, UTA, UNT Medical School. Those always have the shortest lines. Bernadine? You see a lot of enthusiasm among the younger uh, voters. However, mm -hmm. historically, they're not, they're not known to go to the polls. So I think that uh, both camps, both campaigns want to see an increase in the young vote. And perhaps they will this time, but as We've said from the beginning, each camp, each campaign must get their supporters to the polls. Mm -hmm. And if the younger voters support it, whichever campaign, they've got to get them to the polls. Alana, can that energy be sustained over the next few weeks? You know, it's going to come down to the campaigns. There was that video this week of a, a work uh, jogging uh, with supporters there in Dallas, mm -hmm. and I and I thought to myself, oh, is he jogging around to show them where their polling place is? Because it's going to come down to his camp um, mm -hmm. and, you know, the other campaigns getting their voters out. I asked a party official for the Democrats just last week if they were organized on getting people to turn out, and, and they told me, uh, you know, just that it's going to come down to the campaign. So uh, I think that's where it lies and a huge disparity in the state between registered voters and actual voters. We will all be watching on Election Day. Alana Rocha with the Texas Tribune, Bud Kennedy with the Star-Telegram, and Bernadine Steptoe with us here at WFAA. Thank you all for being with us, and thank you for watching this Sunday. ABC's This Week starts in a moment. We'll see you next week. Have a great day.